Okay, so yesterday we, we looked at what has happened already, right? We, we put up some evidence for changes that have occurred. We know that climate change isn't a problem for the future. It's something that's it's happening now, and it's having significant effects. We saw, for example, what it's done to the Barrier Reef in a very short period of time. But I don't know if you remember, one of the graphs I showed you was the emissions trajectory, right? And the emissions are going up and up and up and up. So it doesn't take a rocket scientist to realize that things are probably going to get worse before they get better. So rather than looking backwards, now we're going to try and look forwards, and we're going to try and see, can we make some predictions about the climate in the future? And so these are some of the questions we might want to ask. What's the temperature going to be like in 2100 in Australia? Is the barrier reef actually going to survive for the next 20 or 30 years? Will droughts get longer? Will heat waves get hotter? What islands are going to go under because of sea level rise? These are the kind of things that we want to figure out. And you know, I think essentially there's two ways that we can try and make a prediction of the future. One way is to go to a psychic and say, what's the future going to be like? <laughs> <All right. laughs> I see we have a scientist down the front. Another option, and, and a lot of people would prefer the first option to the second option. The second option is to try and use the laws of physics, right, to try and understand what's going to happen in the future. Unfortunately for you, I forgot to bring my crystal ball today, so we're going to go down this second route and have a look at um, climate models, right? These are the tools that we're going to use. So what is a climate model? First of all, a climate model is a tool that we use, climate scientists use, to try and predict how the climate will look like in the future. But it's more than that. It's also a tool for understanding how the climate system works. So a lot of people use climate, system, uh, climate models not just to look at what's going to happen. They try and use it to understand how ocean currents work, how the atmosphere circulates, how temperature goes from one place to another, why we have droughts, why we have... El Niño and La Niña, you can use climate models to do that. You're probably not very familiar with climate models, but you're probably quite familiar with weather forecast models, right? And they're essentially the same thing. They use the same physics, they use the same principles, they're built in very similar ways, except a climate model is not just looking at the atmosphere and the weather in the atmosphere, it also looks at the ocean and the land surface and the cryosphere and the biosphere, all the things that are interacting to affect climate change. It's built as a computer program. So you write lots of code, and the code tells you what climate variables like temperature, rainfall, winds, ocean currents are doing at different places in the world over time. All right? So essentially, it's producing an animation of all these variables over time across the planet. Very importantly, a climate model, and any model, is a simplified version of the real system. Right? So we can't model the, the climate system perfectly. We'd have to simulate every single molecule bouncing around. We'd have to, we just can't do that. Right? So we have to simplify. But we have to simplify in such a way that we can make it complex enough to capture the main factors that are influencing the climate system. And essentially, those factors are based on the laws of physics, and a climate model is based on things like the conservation of energy, the conservation of mass, conservation of angular momentum, so Newton's laws of motion, things like that. A climate model is big. It's a big, hefty piece of code. It's usually millions of lines of code. You usually have to run them on supercomputers. And if you add up the total time it takes to build one of these things, it probably takes hundreds of person years to build a climate model. So we're going to try and build one in the next half an hour, right? But we're going to make it slightly simpler than these you know, very complex state-of-the-art climate models. So this is kind of the ingredients that you need for an, a climate model. You need a bunch of inputs. You need a bunch of inputs that are the things, the factors that affect the climate system, kind of the external factors that affect the climate system. So obviously the climate system, it's driven by energy coming in from the sun, but it's also affected by, well, we saw yesterday that it's affected by greenhouse gases. We put greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, it's gonna warm the planet. So that's gonna be one of our input. And we're gonna 
specifically focus on carbon dioxide and methane, the two most important greenhouse gases. It's also affected by aerosols coming from humans and coming from volcanoes, and we'll talk a little bit about that later on. So actually, we built a climate model yesterday. Right? This is a climate model, very, very simple climate model. It tells us that if we want to know the temperature of the planet, all we have to do is a little bit of energy in, energy out, energy coming in from the sun, some of it gets reflected away, heat being lost by the surface of the planet because of black body radiation, and we can calculate the equilibrium temperature of the planet. That's great, but now we actually want to see how the temperature is changing over time. We don't want to look at an equilibrium solution because the planet isn't in equilibrium. We're changing. The temperature is going up. So we need to do something more than this, although it's still going to be a simple model like this, but we need to do something more than this to understand how things are changing over time. So this is the model that we're going to use. All right? It's even simpler, or it looks even simpler. So we have a box that represents the surface of the climate system, the surface of the ocean, the atmosphere, the land and the cryosphere. And we've got energy coming into that box and energy going out of that box. So if I know the energy in and the energy out, and if I know the heat capacity of that box, I can calculate how that temperature is going to change. Yeah? All right, but let's make a, a simplification. This is some observational data. So it's from 1960 up to almost the present day. And this shows the total amount of energy that's gone into the climate system because of global warming. So people have gone out, taken all these measurements in the ocean, in the atmosphere, in the land surface, and in the, in the cryosphere, and they've seen where the temperature has gone up. They know the heat capacity of all these things, so they can calculate how much heat has gone into the climate system. And what we can see is that most of the energy, almost all the energy, something like 95% of it, has gone into this blue stuff, into the ocean. This is the amount of energy that's gone in to warming up the atmosphere, the land, and the ice. It's a tiny proportion of the total amount of energy. So we're going to make a slight simplification. We're not going to worry about thinking about the atmosphere and the land and the cryosphere. We're just going to worry about the ocean, All right? the surface of the ocean, because that's got most of the heat capacity in the system. OK, but we have to make the ocean slightly more complicated than that one box. If we have a look at the ocean, so this is a plot of a typical, this is temperature on this axis, depth on this axis, typical profile of temperature through the ocean. So if you have a, 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 temp, a thermometer and you put it down into the deep ocean, you'll find that the surface of the ocean, down to a few hundred meters, has the same temperature. It's pretty warm. And then it rapidly drops off and we've got a cold layer underneath. Most of the ocean is cold and we've got this warm, warm layer sitting on top. And why do we have these sort of constant temperatures at the top? Well, we've got energy coming in from the sun at the surface, and we've got mixing occurring here, right? So we've got waves, we've got wind, and that homogenizes the temperature down to about 500 meters, maybe, right? So we've got a box that is, so we're going to have to have a box that is 500 meters thick to represent this upper ocean. But we do have leakage of heat down into the deep ocean. And that turns out to be important enough that we have to take, in, take that into account. So we're going to split our ocean into two boxes, the surface ocean. And the surface ocean responds very quickly to changes in what's happening, the energy in, energy out of the surface. And the deep ocean responds a lot more slowly because the energy is transferred very slowly between the surface and the deep ocean. But we do need to take it into consideration if we want to get a realistic answer to how temperature changes. OK, so now we can come up with some equations to describe what's happening in these boxes. Well, if we look at the top box, we can say, all right, if we want to know the change in energy in that top box per second, we need to know the energy coming in per second, the energy going out per second, and the energy going down per second. Right? That's this equation up here. Energy coming in per second equal, oh, sorry, the Change in energy in the box per second is the energy coming in, energy going out, energy going out. The lower box is even simpler. The change in energy in the lower box is just the energy coming from the upper box. All right, simple. All right, now we've got to write these down 
in a little bit more mathematical way. So let's look at just the top equation, the top, top box, and let's look at this first term, the change in energy in the surface of the ocean. Well, we know the surface of the ocean is 500 meters thick. We know the specific heat capacity of water, how many joules it takes to raise the temperature of water by one degree centigrade. And we know the area of the ocean, so we can calculate the heat capacity, which I've called C, of the ocean. So if I, cal cal if I multiply the heat capacity by the change in temperature, that gives me the change in energy. Or if I divide, oh, there's some units for you. So the mass of the ocean, kilograms, units for specific heat capacity, change in temperature, that's going to give me joules, right? So it's telling me the change in energy is in joules. If I take this equation and divide by time, this is now saying the change in energy per second is the heat capacity times the rate of change of temperature. Right, it's kind of simple. So let's take this and we'll plug it in here. All right, so we've got the left-hand side of the equation. All right, now the next term, the energy coming in. Well, if we have a look at a, a figure that shows the energy coming in, well, we discussed this yesterday. We've got energy coming in from the sun, but some of that gets reflected away. We've got energy coming in because of the greenhouse effect. But the greenhouse effect depends on how much greenhouse gases we've got in the atmosphere. It also depends on other things like aerosols, which I'll talk about in a second. So this is a, a bit of a complicated one. We'll come back to this in a second, right? So we're going to say this is the energy in. How about the energy out? Well, the energy out, we've got black body radiation, right? The Earth has a temperature, so it emits black body radiation. We've also got a few other sources of energy out. But I'm going to ignore those because they're not very big. I'm just going to worry about this one. I'm going to say the energy out is pretty much Stefan Boltzmann rule, right? Black body radiation. Let's draw a graph of that. Looks like this, right? T to the 4. So if my energy, if my temperature goes up, my energy going out of the planet increases as the fourth power of temperature. That's a bit complicated for me. I don't like fourth powers, so we're going to make a slight simplification here. We know that the temperature of the planet is around 290 degrees. So if I zoom in at this area here, oh, it looks like a straight line. That's great. So instead of having a T to the 4, as long as I'm just worried about temperatures that are close to 290 degrees, I could use this equation instead. I can use a straight line equation. Right? It makes the maths a little bit easier. So I'm going to use the straight line equation, and I'm going to put it in there. That's my energy going out at the surface, going up into space. And what about that last term, the energy going down into the deep ocean? Well, there's our surface ocean and our deep ocean. Well, we know that if the temperature of the surface ocean were the same as the temperature of the deep ocean, there would be no change in, there would be no flux of heat, right? And we know that if this temperature was much bigger than this temperature, then the heat is going to go down into the deep ocean. Or if the deep ocean was warmer than the surface ocean, then the energy would go upwards. So we could write an equation that says, well, the energy being transferred is proportional to T minus T naught. So if the temperature at the surface and the temperature of the deep ocean is the same, then we don't have any, this, this turns to zero, we don't have energy, energy transfer. If the temperature at the surface is bigger the, than the temperature at the deep ocean, then we have a flux of heat going into the deep ocean. Simple way of expressing sort of the heat going into the deep ocean. So there we've got the equation for the top box. All right, now let's look at the bottom box. Bottom box was just changing energy in the deep ocean equals energy coming in from the top box. Well, we can do the same thing as we did for the first equation. The change in energy in the deep ocean is just going to be the heat capacity of the deep ocean times the rate of change of temperature of the deep ocean. Yep. Energy received from the surface, well, that's easy. We know that this amount of energy is coming out of the top box. So the same amount has to be going into the bottom box. So it's just the same, 
value, but it's a positive. All right? So the energy coming out will be the energy going in here. So here's our model. And this is our model of the climate system. This is our climate model, essentially, or at least the heart of the climate model. All right, so what have we got so far? Can we solve these equations? Well, we want to try and find out what T is and what T naught is. C, is, C and C naught are constants that we can calculate. We can calculate the heat capacity of the surface ocean and the deep ocean. We've got some constants here. We've got a lambda and a gamma. Well, you can go out and you can actually do some experiments and you can figure out what those constants are. So I'm going to tell you what the value of these different constants are. So we've got all these things. The problem is we don't know what this energy in is. All right? So we've got two, we've got three unknowns at the moment, so, and only two equations, so we can't solve it. We would no, need to know how much energy is coming into the climate system to be able to solve these equations. So let's say we know what that energy in is. All right? Let's say we actually made measurements of the amount of energy coming into the climate system over the past 150 years. So here's a time series. These are measurements of energy coming in over the last 150 years from 1850 up to the present day. Right? Squiggles around a bit, goes up a little bit. So now we have two unknowns, temperature at the surface and temperature at the deep ocean, and so we should be able to solve these two equations. I'm just going to add some just going to put some t's into this equation just to make it obvious which of these functions are functions of time. All right? So I'm just telling us here that temperature depends on time. It changes with time. The energy in changes with time. The deep ocean temperature changes with time. And what we're trying to do now is trying to figure out what the temperature of the surface of the ocean is and what the, what the temperature of the deep ocean is. We've got to solve these equations. They're differential equations, two differential equations. Well, if the energy in was a nice simple function, say it was a constant, you'd be able to go to your textbooks and you probably could solve these two equations algebraically. It would involve something with exponentials in. The problem is, because this isn't a nice straightforward function like a constant or a sine or something like that, it's a jiggledy line. We can't solve this equation using analytical methods. We have to solve this numerically. All right? And some of you might have done numerical solutions to equations, newton raphson solutions. I'm going to use a very, very simple way of solving these equations. Let's draw a graph of temperature against time. All right? And let's say we knew what the temperature curve looks like. This is how temperature changes with time. And we are trying to look at what does d big T by d little t mean, right? What does it mean? Well, that's a gradient, right? So if my time here is t, dt dt is just this dotted line. It's the gradient at this point. Make sense? I can approximate that gradient if I take another point a little bit further forward in time. All right, time dt in front, and I calculate the change in temperature here divided by the change in temperature here. That's going to give me a gradient that is sort of the slope between these two dots. And it's pretty similar to the dotted line. It's not perfect, but it's pretty similar. In fact, if I shrunk this delta t, it would get more and more accurate. Well, let's stick with what we've got. So I'm going to approximate delta T by delta T as the temperature here minus the temperature here minus, divided by the time in between. And I'm going to take this approximation and I'm going to plug it back into here. All right, so I've got that equation. Now I'm going to rearrange this equation a bit. I'm going to multiply through by delta T I'm going to divide through by C, and I'm going to take this term over to the left-hand side of the equation, and you get this. All right, now I'm going to do the same thing for the bottom box. 
right? This was our equation for the bottom box. I'm going to approximate this gradient in the same way as I approximated this gradient. And then I'm going to rearrange the equation. So I'm going to multiply by delta t, divide by c naught, take this over to the other side, and I get this equation. All right, why have I bothered to do all this? Well, let's take a look at these two equations that we've got. These are actually really cool. This is telling me, if I know what the temperature of the surface ocean is now, and what the temperature of the deep ocean is now, and what the energy in is now, which I can get from this graph, I can calculate what the temperature is going to be a little bit into the future. Right? I can predict the future based on what's happening now. So, for example, if I knew what the temperature was at, in 1850 in the surface ocean and the deep ocean, and I knew how much energy is coming in, well, I know it from this graph, then I can use this equation to calculate what the temperature is going to be in 1851. But if I know what the temperature at the surface and in the deep ocean is in 1851, I can plug it back into this equation again and figure out what the temperature is going to be like in 1852. And then I can plug that back in here again and figure out what the temperature is going to be like in 1853, and so on. And I can keep on going until I get up to the present day. I can't go any further, because now I haven't got information for what energy in is going to be in 2020. Right? So I have to stop here. But at least I've managed to calculate, using these equations, how the temperature has changed in the past. All right, that's all well and good, but I really do want to look at what's happening in the future. I know what's happened in the past. I've got measurements of what's happened in the past. So if I want to know what's happening in the future, well, I'm going to have to extend my energy in. So let's just extend it. I'm going to draw a line and extend it. So now, I know what my energy in is in 2019, and I know what my temperature is in 2019, so I can calculate what it is in 2020. And if I know what it is in 2020, I can plug those numbers back into here and take the 2020 value for the energy in, and it's going to give me what's happening in 2021, and so on and so on, until I get to the end of this line. So now, I know what the temperature is in 2100. Great, I'm predicting the future. OK, the fallacy in all of this is that I've just drawn a squiggly line. Right? That's not what energy in is going to do in the future. So we're going to do, need to do something a little bit more sophisticated. All right, so let's take a step back. This is what we've done so far. This is what we've said a climate model should look like. All right? We have a bunch of inputs. We put it through our mathematical climate model, and it's going to spit out a bunch of outputs. What we have at the moment looks like this. All right? This is our climate model at the moment. Our input is the energy coming in to the planet. We're putting it through this climate model, which is consisting of two boxes and three arrows. And it is telling us how the surface temperature and how the deep ocean temperature change with time. So now we're going to focus on this, the energy coming in, and try and get a little bit more sophisticated. What are the factors that affect the energy coming into the surface of the planet? Well, we spoke about one of them yesterday. We said, all right, we've got energy coming in from the sun. So let's say we have an input variable, which is the energy at the top of the atmosphere. All right, that's going to be our input to the climate model. So we've got this. If we have this, I want to know how much energy is coming in at the surface of the planet. Um, we said how we do that yesterday. Well, we'd have to look at how much energy is going in through a circle that has a radius equal to the radius of the Earth. And we'd have to multiply that by the energy out here, so S times pi r squared. Then we'd have to divide that by the surface area of the planet, because the planet's rotating, and that energy is distributed over the whole surface of that planet. And that's going to give us, divide by 4 pi r squared, 4 pi r squared. it gives us S over 4. And then we've said, well, some of that gets reflected away. A proportion alpha gets reflected away. So what is left over is 1 minus alpha. 
So the energy coming into the planet is this equation. So if I know the energy at the top of the atmosphere, something that I can measure using satellites, I can calculate the energy coming in per meter squared at the surface of the planet. All right, that's the energy coming in. All right, what else affects temperatures? All right, here's a graph of temperature. So this is over the last thousand years. This is the, close to the present day. So over here, we're seeing the temperatures going up. Why are the temperatures going up? What are the factors that are in, causing the temperature to go up there that we think? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, right? So we've got, those are probably two factors that we've got to take into account. What about here? Can we see we've got these dips? We've got a dip here, and a dip here, and a dip here. Something has caused the planet's temperature to cool down. Can anyone guess what that might be? Yeah? Would the first one be black plague because so many people died and then forests was able to grow back, which decreased the CO2 emissions? Good guess, but no. Yeah? No, it's not changes in there. Those tend to act on much, much longer timescales. That is a factor that we would need to take into account if we were looking at hundreds of thousands of years. But because we're looking at a much shorter period of time, we don't have to worry about that. Anyone think of else? what else? Huge volcanic eruptions. All right. These are the three super volcano eruptions. So volcanoes spew out aerosols, particles, into the upper atmosphere, into the stratosphere. And these particles reflect away the sun's energy. But the particles gradually drop out over a time scale of two or three years. So they'll cool the planet for a few years. So exactly. We've got aerosols generated by volcanoes cause these reductions in global temperature. All right. We also have human aerosols. We also put aerosols into the atmosphere by burning fossil fuels, right? We create smog, it goes into the atmosphere, little particles. It's slightly different, though. The particles that we emit into the atmosphere don't go into the upper atmosphere. They go into the lower atmosphere. They go into the troposphere. And so their, their behavior is, is slightly different. If you pump aerosols into the lower atmosphere and you stop pumping them, immediately they'll fall out again. Within a day or so, they'll fall out. So if I drew a graph of a pulse of particles coming from a volcano, the amount of particles in the atmosphere would go up very rapidly and then it would die off exponentially with time. If I put a pulse of human aerosols into the atmosphere and turned it off, it would drop back down very quickly. So we need to write some equations down to say, all right, if we know how much aerosol is going into the atmosphere from this and this, how, what's, what's the effect on the energy going to be? All right, so let's write down a few equations. So this is the time series of volcanic eruptions. So each one of these is when we had a volcanic eruption um, from 1850 to the present day. There was the last big one, Pinatubo. And some information we have here is that the time it takes for the particles to drop out of the atmosphere is about two and a half years. So if we had a graph, if we have an equation like this, so Fv is the amount of particles that we're emitting into the atmosphere per second. Right? So if the equation were this, the amount of particles in, or the change in the amount of particles per second in the atmosphere equals the amount of particles we're putting into the atmosphere. If this was a constant, for example, then the amount of particles we had would just go up over time, right? If you integrate that equation, if you just bring this over this, this side, this would be proportional to time. But we know that it also decays with time. So if I had an equation that looked like that, this equation, if I solved it, would look like this. It would be an exponential decay. But I've got both of those things happening at the same time. So actually, my equation is like this. I've got the change in the amount of particles in the atmosphere depends on how much I'm putting out, and this is saying that that amount decays over time exponentially. So that's telling me the amount of particles I've got in the atmosphere. Now I've got to convert that into an energy. Well, we know 
that if I put more particles in, I'm going to have less energy coming through because more is being reflected away. Yeah? So we could write that something like this. So if we know the number of particles coming in, the amount of energy coming in is proportional to the number of particles, but it's negatively proportional. So if the number of particles increase, then the energy coming in decreases. Make sense? So if I use these equations and look at what it gives us, this is the energy coming in. It looks like, it almost looks like a mirror image of the particles we're putting in. But if you look more carefully, say if we look at this volcano, volcanic eruption here, as the volcanic emissions go into the atmosphere, the energy starts coming down. But then even after it's gone, we can see there's still a response, but it's decaying exponentially over time. So there's the exponential decay here. So it's not quite a mirror image. OK, so we've got the equations that tell us how much energy is coming in because of volcanic emissions. We've still got to solve this equation. We can solve this equation in exactly the same way as we solve the temperature equation. We can make this approximation and dump this in here. So we've got a way of solving this equation. All right, how about human aerosols? That's a lot easier. So here's the equation for human aerosols. We don't have a differential equation here because it's easy, right? It's like if you have a hose of water, right, and I fire the hose up into the air. If I don't have any water pressure, I won't have any water in the atmosphere. If I turn it up high, there'll be lots of water in the atmosphere. If I switch it off, there'll be no water in the atmosphere. Right? So the amount of water or the amount of particles in the atmosphere just depends on how much I'm dumping up. But then energy depends on minus that, because as we put more particles up, we're actually having more energy or less energy coming in. So this one is a mirror image of our human aerosols going into the atmosphere. OK, methane. Methane comes from, yes, it does actually come from farting cows. But there are other sources. It comes from industrial waste, or waste in general. You put landfills, the decaying material goes into the atmosphere. It comes from the decay of agricultural pre um, products. So there's a bunch of different sources of methane. And here are the equations that we use for methane. So it looks very much like the equation that we had for the volcanic aerosols. The amount of methane, or the change in the methane in the atmosphere, depends on how much methane we're pumping into the atmosphere, but then it decays over time. Over time, the methane um, undergoes chemical reactions, and it dissociates. Right? It stops being methane. And the time scale for methane is about 10 years. It takes about 10 years to drop down to half of what the original concentration was. So that's, so we can use that to calculate how much methane there is in the atmosphere. OK, but it's not like volcanic aerosols. If we put methane into the atmosphere, the, actual, the energy coming in increases. It doesn't decrease. But it doesn't increase linearly. Right? If I double the amount of um, methane, it increases the energy. If I double it again, it won't increase it by the same amount. It actually increases it logarithmically. Right? So the energy coming in is dependent on the log of the methane in the atmosphere. Kind of a simple explanation for that is imagine a sunglass. Right? A sunglass blocks 50% of light right, going through it. So if I have 100 units of light, I'll have 50 units of light coming out. Now, if I put a second sunglass in front of that one, the second sunglass won't block 50 units of light. It will block 25 units of light, 50% of the 50%. And then another one, it will be 50% of the 50% of the 50%. So each sunglass that we're putting in is blocking a, a lesser amount. And it's a logarithmic relationship. So that's kind of the explanation for why we have a logarithmic, logarithmic relationship here. All right, so again, we've got, oh, that's what it would look like. There's our energy, there's our input, the amount of methane we're putting into the atmosphere, and there it's telling us the methane in the atmosphere would go up and it would decay exponentially over time. 
And again, we can solve that equation by making this approximation, putting these in here, and we'll be able to solve this. Finally, we've got carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide. The equations look almost exactly the same as the methane. Right? We've got this same equation that the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere depends on how much carbon dioxide we're emitting into the atmosphere, and we've got this exponential decay. The difference is, for methane, the time scale of decay is 15 or 16 years, right? It's only a few years and the methane is gone. With carbon dioxide, the half-life of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is hundreds of years, right? So we put carbon dioxide in the atmosphere now, it's going to have an effect, it's going to have a greenhouse effect for hundreds of years. So if I plot that, the die-off, the exponential decay is much, much slower. All right, so now we've got all the ingredients. We've got a way of, if we have these inputs, if we have the amount of energy at the top of the atmosphere, the amount of volcanic aerosols going into the atmosphere, the amount of human aerosols going into the atmosphere, the amount of methane we're emitting, the amount of carbon dioxide we're emitting, we can use these equations to calculate the energy from the sun, the energy from volcanoes, the energy from aerosols, the energy from methane, and the energy from carbon dioxide. All right, so now, instead of this being our model, our model looks like this. Our inputs are now the energy from the sun, the emissions of volcanoes, humans, methane, CO2. We've got these equations that turn this <coughs> into energy in. We dump this through our climate model, churn the handle, and it's going to give us our temperature of the deep ocean and temperature of the surface of the ocean. <coughs> Sorry. Okay, so here are some observations. So these are observations of those inputs. This is what the sun was doing at the top of the atmosphere over the last 150 years. These are the volcanic emissions. This is how human aerosols have been emitted into the atmosphere. This is the emission of methane. This is the emission of CO2. So now, given that we've got these inputs, I can use this equation to turn this into this. Looks kind of the same, but you'll see the units are different. This is the energy coming in at the surface of the planet. Or I can use this equation, or these set of equations, to turn this into this. This is the energy decrease because of volcanic eruptions. This is the energy decrease because of aerosols. This is the energy increase because of methane emissions. And this is the energy increase because of CO2. And you'll notice that all of those had units that were the same, watts per meter squared. All right? So it's energy coming into the surface of the planet. All right, so now I can take those and I can add them all up. And that gives me a graph of the energy coming into the climate system over time. I can plug that into our climate model using these equations that we came up with earlier. I can start in 1850. I can calculate what the temperature is in 1851, plug that back into here, and so on, and get the temperature all the way through. So if we get the output of the model, it looks like this. All right, so now we've created this model using those inputs, and it's telling us that over the past 150 years, we think, based on this model, based on the observations of those inputs, temperature at the surface of the planet should have gone up, gone up about one degree. And that's pretty much how much it's gone up by. It's gone up by one degree. I'm going to show you now output from a state-of-the-art climate model that took 100 years to build. Looks almost exactly the same, right? So our model that we built in half an hour can produce almost the same results. They're not exactly the same, but almost the same results as that very, very expensive climate model, and I've done it for you for free. OK, so we've got confidence. So this gives us confidence that our simple model is doing the right thing. 
right? It's telling us that maybe we've, we've done this right. But we're still stuck with the same problem, right? I'm telling you what the temperature has been over the last 150 years. Still, it hasn't got us any f further forward into what's happening in the future. Well, actually it has, right? We want to look at the future. And some of these things are predictable, all right? Or we can at least make hazard a guess of what these things are going to do in the future. Well, the energy from the sun, well, you can see that this is, it squiggles up and down, right? There's this 11-year cycle in the energy coming from the sun, and that's probably going to continue into the future. And also, the energy doesn't change very much. The energy coming from the sun is it's almost constant, right? So it's probably going to be almost constant going into the future. So maybe a good guess for what's going to happen is not very much at all. It's just going to keep on doing what it's doing in the past. Volcanic emissions, that's one of the tricky ones. We have no idea what volcanoes we're going to have in the future. Right? It's a random process. But it doesn't really matter because it turns out that the effect of volcanoes is only short term. It causes those dips, but then it comes back to where it started from. So even if we ignore volcanoes, yes, we won't get the squiggles in the right place, but the overall temperature increase we can get right. So I'm going to just ignore volcanoes and say there are no volcanoes in the future. Human emissions of aerosols. Well, we've got a pretty good idea of what's going to happen to human emission of aerosols. Right? We've, we've got technologies now that are in place that can reduce the emissions of aerosol. And so we're pretty sure that over time our emissions of aerosol are going to go down. Right? So we can maybe predict that the aerosols are going to go down. That leaves us with these two. All right? I have no idea what's going to happen to methane and CO2 emissions. All right? That depends. That depends on whether we all follow the Paris Agreement or whether we don't. All right? It depends on who's going to be the next president or prime minister of powerful countries. It depends on these things. All right, so what am I going to do? All right, let's, let's just make a guess. All right, let's say that the population of the planet stabilizes over time and starts going down in the, beyond sort of the middle of the century, and we accept that we need to move all our energy systems to renewable. Well, you can go out and you can do a bunch of calculations. You can look at the demographics, the population, the energy consumption, and you can figure out what that would mean for methane and... CO2 emissions. There are actually teams of scientists that go out and come up with these stories. They come up and say, all right, well, if the population goes up by this much and comes down by this much, and if some of the population moves to this energy source and some of the population moves to this energy source, what would it mean for emissions of CO2 and methane and all these other greenhouse gases? And they tell us that, well, if we were to move in that direction, then our emissions of methane and our emissions of CO2 Whoops, would go down like that. All right, so now we've got some inputs that we're guesstimating for the future. So now we can do the same as we did before. We can take those inputs, we can pass them through our climate model, and we can see what it tells us for the temperatures in the future. All right, it tells us that if we follow this trajectory, if we peak our emissions of carbon dioxide in the next few years and then ramp them down over the next few decades, then temperature is still going to go up, but it will probably level off at around 2 degrees centigrade. OK. But what if that doesn't happen, right? What if the politicians don't take our advice and they say, let's go for it. Let's just burn this fossil fuel. Let's make as much money as we can. Let's go down a different trajectory. Let's go down this red trajectory instead. All right? And that's another scenario that scientists have come up with. They've gone and thought, all right, if we have large population increases, if we keep on business as usual burning fossil fuels with very little um, increase in renewables, then this 
These are the trajectories that we'd expect for carbon dioxide and methane over the next 100 years. And they've come up with bunches of other scenarios. So here's some in-between scenarios. And we can plug these through our model, and this is what we get. All right, so if we've said, if we bring our emissions down very rapidly, we've got an increase in temperature of two degrees. If we keep on going up, then we're going to get an increase of temperature somewhere around five degrees centigrade. This is an extremely big number. It doesn't sound like a lot, five degrees centigrade. If you went down five degrees centigrade, you'd be pretty much in an ice age. All right? At five degrees centigrade, there would be no barrier reef. There would be no Arctic sea ice. Lots of animals and plants would go extinct. Large parts of the tropics would be uninhabitable. Sea level rise will have wiped out a large number of islands. At two degrees, the situation is a lot less dramatic. All right? There's still going to be impacts at two degrees. Remember, we've come up one degree so far, all right? and already we're seeing impacts. And this is saying even if we bring our emissions down really, really rapidly, we're likely to get another one degree rise. So we're, into, we're, we're going to see some severe impacts, but at least we're not seeing the impacts that we're seeing up here. This is a very important thing to remember when we're looking at something like this. I have not done a prediction. I've not made a prediction of the future. Right? This is what, if I had my crystal ball, I would tell you that in the future, the temperature is going to be 3.5 degrees warmer. I haven't told you that. I have told you if I go down this trajectory, temperature is going to increase by two degrees. If I go along this trajectory, temperature is going to be going up by five degrees. I've come up with a bunch of what-if scenarios. Climate models do not make predictions. They make what we call projections. They're what-if scenarios. And it doesn't make sense unless, unless you give the scenario as well. So if someone tells you, oh, the climate models are telling us that it's going up by five degrees, that's wrong. It's only going up by five degrees if we follow this pathway. If we follow this pathway, the climate models are telling us something else. OK, we can do a reality check again. We can say, all right, this is using our very simple model. What if we'd done exactly the same thing but using these state-of-the-art climate models? Well, we get something that looks like this. This is the output from state-of-the-art climate models using exactly the same emission scenarios. And you can see that these two graphs look very, very similar to each other. Right? They're telling us almost exactly the same thing. And this is telling us that the physics that we've used here is good enough to predict the global average temperature. Climate models can tell us a lot of other things. It tells us not only about temperature, but about rainfall and currents and winds and droughts and floods and all this kind of stuff, which our model can't do. But our model is very good at telling us what's going to happen to global average temperature. OK, so let's do one other thing. When you have a climate model, it's kind of like playing God. I can do things with that climate model. Right? I can, for example, let's, let's take this high emission scenario. So let's imagine that we did decide to go this route, and governments decided that they wanted to burn lots of fossil fuels. But they don't like the idea of temperatures going up. All right? So what can we do about that? Well, we know that aerosols block sunlight. So what would happen if instead of the aerosols coming down like that, we really ramped them up? If we spewed out loads and loads of aerosols into the atmosphere, all right? pump massive pollution into the atmosphere? What would happen? Well, let's pump it up like that. All right. And now I can run that scenario through my climate model and look at what would happen. Look at that. I've managed to stabilize my temperatures at one and a half degree. All right. So I've found a solution to global warming. All right. I don't have to change my energy system. I can just pump loads of aerosols into the atmosphere. 
All right? Good idea, right? You laugh, but it's a real idea. All right? Scientists are working on this. Governments like this idea. All right? And it's, they like it because it's really cheap. For a few billion dollars, which is nothing, you could create this scenario. You have a few systems like this where you have aerosols being pumped up a hollow tube, attached to balloons, going into the stratosphere, and you could, you could do this. Of course, there may be some implications for doing this, right? Can anyone think of why this might not be a good idea? It will all come back down again, right? So we're going to get pollution all over the place, and people don't like that kind of pollution. You know, you go to some big cities and you can see what, what pollution is like. It might not be so bad if we inject it into the stratosphere, so it's not sort of affecting us directly. Yeah? Okay, so we're blocking sunlight. So we've got less sunlight available for photosynthesis. That's a good one. Might damage our agriculture. Yeah, we could have pollutants coming into the agriculture. Yeah? Might be health side effects. What's happened? Yep. Ozone depletion. No, I don't know. How, how will it affect ozone? I'm not sure. That's a good point, right? So we've got a machine that's spewing out this stuff. Say there's a war or something, and all these <laughs> balloons are blown up. You could run a scenario where the emissions are going up, and suddenly we drop it down to zero again. What you'd find here is that that temperature immediately jumps up to where it would have been. So that's going to be really dramatic, right? We're going to see this massive rise in temperature very quickly if something goes wrong with this system. Another really big problem is that although the temperature is stabilized, we've still got carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. If carbon dioxide is going into the atmosphere, more of it's going into the ocean, right? And if it's going into the ocean, our oceans are still acidifying. And probably because the temperature is going up, we'll get lazy. We'll think, oh, we don't have to stop emitting carbon dioxide in, into the atmosphere. Let's put more into the atmosphere. It doesn't really matter. But what's it going to do to all the marine life on which we are heavily dependent? So we've put together a, uh, a website. So if you're interested, you can go into this website, carbonator.org, and all those input variables, you can play around with them. And you can see what will happen if we do geoengineering. There's a whole bunch of scenarios you can do. You could, you could look at what happened if we painted all the houses white. What happened if we um, dropped our emissions to zero immediately? And you could figure out what it would do to the planet. So I encourage you to take a look at this. All right, so here's our simple model of the climate system. All right, what's the difference between this and a state-of-the-art climate system? Well, it's not capturing everything, right? We know that if we go down in the ocean, we don't just have one layer that's one temperature and one layer that's another temperature. Actually, the temperatures change with depth. And they're not the same in the tropics and the poles, right? They change with location as well. So actually, if we wanted to do this properly, we'd have to have a lot more boxes, a lot more boxes interacting with each other. And while I'm an oceanographer, and I like to think that the oceans are the most important part of the climate system, the atmosphere and the cryosphere and the land surface are also important, right? They transport heat from one place to another. So we have to really include the land and the atmosphere and the cryosphere as well, right? And these things have to be dynamic as well. Imagine ice, right? If we're going to simulate ice, those boxes, sometimes they grow and sometimes they shrink. So we're going to have to simulate that. But also, it's not just the transfer of energy. We've got the transfer of mass as well. We've got winds and currents that take stuff from one place to another. So we can't just use the conservation of energy. We need to use the physics that describes fluid motion as well, fluid mechanics, right? which is essentially Newton's laws. So we need to plug all those things in, and then 
we will end up with something that looks like this. The world is split up into lots of grid cells, both horizontally and in the vertical, so going up into the atmosphere and going down into the ocean. And each of these grid cells are communicating with the nearest neighbors in a language that is saying conservation of energy, conservation of mass, conservation of momentum, conservation of angular momentum. And if you put all that kind of stuff together, then you get simulations that look like this. I don't know how to start this. Can I just click? You're on this one. Oh, all right. Cool. So this is a simulation that's showing um, surface currents. Right? So actually, there's lots and lots of little grid boxes. You just can't see them here. But you can see it's showing this really intricate behavior. The climate models, the, the state of the cli uh, climate models, are showing how the currents move things from one place to another. Or here's another one that's showing what's happening in the atmosphere, the movements of clouds and the movement of <coughs> gases in the atmosphere. Or this one is doing the same thing that we did, right? It's using one of those scenarios, but it's showing not how the globally average temperature is changing, it's looking how temperature is changing around the planet. And we can see, for example, that going into the future, the Arctic is warming more than the other places. Well, we don't have to look at temperature, we can look at rainfall. This is the climate model telling us what's going to happen to rainfall in the future. So that's all I've got. Um, again, I'd encourage you to take a look at this website if you're interested in this kind of thing. It's got all the explanation of how you build the climate model, how you solve the mathematical equations, and it allows you to do a lot. It allows you to play around with these input variables in the climate system and see not only what the output temperature is, the model we've We've extended it to allow you to look at sea level, to look at ocean acidification, and look at various other variables. So have a look. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Alex.